Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Rita McGrath, professor at Columbia University, widely recognized as a premier expert on leading innovation and growth during times of uncertainty, received the number one achievement award for strategy from the prestigious Thinkers 50, and has been consistently named one of the world's top 10 management thinkers in its biannual ranking. So let's get started. Professor Rita, I would first like you to introduce yourself to the crowd as well, just so in, you can cover anything in case I missed anything. Oh, sure. So, um, so hello, all. A, a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my work is really at the intersection of strategy and innovation, and the big, I think, theme of a lot of what I talk about is competitive advantage in the sense of having a business model that can produce decent results. It's getting shorter because entry barriers are coming down and we're seeing, therefore, that people need to get smarter about innovation and they also need to get smarter about transformation. So when an old model has started to go away, how do you now transition your organization to the next model? So that's what takes up a lot, a lot of my time. Uh, I've been at Columbia forever, probably since before most of you were born. <laughs> and, and while I'm there, I've taught, I've taught all across our different programs, and I tend to teach programs on innovation and growth. So kind of to elaborate on that, we wanted to talk to you and we wanted to ask you about your discovery-driven growth approach, and we want you to elaborate on it. because it's, Sure. Well, so discovery-driven planning um, had, its, had its roots in a series of studies that I did of corporate flops. Like, these are the ones where supposedly smart, intelligent companies that know what they're doing get into terrible situations uh, when they try to go beyond their existing core business. And so in, back in the day, right, I studied Euro Disney. This was, you know, Disney's a super smart company. How, how could they possibly have gotten into such trouble when they went to France? Or um, Federal Express's Zap Mail venture, which was, you'd go to a FedEx office, now this is like in ancient history, you'd go to a FedEx office, and they would zap mail your document to another FedEx office, which was a big improvement over um, telegraphs, but that got upended when the facts got invented, and, 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 and. More recently, examples you may have heard of is uh, Anheuser-Busch and Keurig uh, created this cocktail machine venture called Drinkworks. And after blowing, I don't know how many tens of millions on it, in December of 2021, they shut it down completely unceremoniously. Or um, Zillow, you, you, you probably know Zillow. Uh, they had this thing called Zillow Offers where they'd offer to buy your home for cash and then fix it up and try to flip it. And they had this belief that their algorithms were going to give them superior capability in that. Anyway, when you look at all these things, what you find is a very consistent pattern. Uh, untested assumptions taken as facts, very few opportunities for low commitment testing of the idea, very often the team and the money all up front, you know, Early stage ventures with too much money, ironically, often go terribly wrong. Uh, and oftentimes it's leaders personally associated with a single expression of this idea. So when I looked at those patterns, my, my colleague and I um, said, there's got to be a better way to do this, right? And so what we came up with was a concept called discovery-driven planning. And basically it looks like this. You define success before you start. So if everything worked out in your wildest dreams, what would that look like? Then you figure out what you think you'll be selling. So what's your unit of business? What that allows you to do is create what I call a reverse or upside down income statement. Um, then you work backward into your plan and you say, well, if that's my goal, what would have to be true along the way? And then you, you run the plan through a series of what I call key checkpoints, where a checkpoint is something that's going to teach you something. So it could be initial customer interviews, it could be doing a prototype, it could be designing your digital architecture, figuring out what your ecosystem looks like. But the idea is you, you budget and plan to the next checkpoint, then you take a step back and say, what have we learned? And should we race? And the race stands for, should we redirect? Because we've learned something that shows us our current direction isn't going to work. Should we accelerate? Maybe we need to move faster. Should we just continue? Or should we exit? Maybe, maybe we've learned enough to know that we shouldn't move forward with this, this plan. And so you do that at every checkpoint. And what that does is it reduces your risk, because you know exactly what your exposure is to the next checkpoint. And it creates the capacity to learn very quickly. So in a nutshell, that's what the whole technique's about. Awesome, and I guess my, because uh, we're all college students, my next question has to be, how do we apply this method? 
how do we as college students apply this not only to our own ventures, but also to our studies? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, you know, you presumably did not make the decision to attend college lightly. Like <laughs> you and the, all those people writing checks behind you, like they're, they're kind of looking for you. And I would say you don't want to pin yourself down too specifically at such an early stage. But I think it does help to say, hey, you know, in three years, five years, what would good look like for me? And then how would I begin to uh, set myself up for getting into those areas? So I would encourage you to take on a lot of learning. Um, I'd really encourage you to build your networks at this stage. This is a very powerful kind of opportunity to build relationships with people who are going to be sources of information, sources of social capital, sources of funding, sources of support. And when you're building your networks, there's two pieces of advice that I think are, are important because there are two kinds of networks you'll be building. So the first kind of network is an execution network. So, you know, you know each other, you finish each other's sentences, you've built up enormous trust, you know, you have their back, they have yours, that's amazing. But we also forget there's a second kind of network, which is a loose tie entrepreneurial network. And these are people you may not even know very well, but because they're outside of all the knowledge of what your tight execution network has, that's a lot of times where you learn about new opportunities, new things opening up. They're vast sources of information. And if you look at startups, at entrepreneurs, um, they often get their ideas for uh, new talent, for new kinds of customer need. You know, that, those, They come from those weak tie networks. Okay, I want to come back to your, your growth plan, your growth approach a little bit later, but first I want to talk to you a little bit more about your career. Sure. So can you please explain to us kind of how you got to not only be a professor, but kind of the steps and twists and turns that you've taken to become <laughs> there a There were a lot. Um, sure. So, um, so I did my undergraduate degree at Barnard College, um, just up the road here. Uh, and then I did my public policy degree, my Master of Public Administration at Columbia's SIPA, which is, you know, SIPA, Harvard's Kennedy School, and what was the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton were probably the top three public policy schools uh, in, in, the, in the country. Um, and my initial interest was in politics and public policy. So I started two little businesses in that realm. I, I did have a startup background. And I made the kind of stupid mistakes you make when you're like in your early 20s starting a business. I forgot elections don't happen every year. <laughs> So year one, we did amazingly well. It was great. It was great. And then year two, we're all sitting around the office going, where is everybody? Because especially in New York City, you know, elections happen like off years, and then you have a year where nothing happens. So then that business kind of morphed into what we would think of today as like a FedEx office, kind of 24-hour typing word processing and stuff like that. And I had one of these dark nights of the soul where I realized I didn't get into this to do typing and word processing. I got into this to, to do things in politics and public policy. So gave up on that. Uh, sold my interest in the business to my partner, and I took a job actually with the city of New York. And we were involved at the time in what today we would call a digital transformation. It was, we didn't call it that then, we called it computerization. But it was, it was great. And you know, those of you with an interest in public policy, it's an amazing place to be at the beginning of your career because if you are at all competent, your career goes like this for the first five years. Now the problem is after about 10 years, your career goes like that for the rest of your life. Um, and so I got to kind of that turning point. I'd been there eight years and I got to that turning point and I was thinking to myself, we were, I'd been, I had gotten married and we were thinking of, you know, starting a family and thinking about how do we, how do we balance like what this is. And I could have continued on in IT, but I thought I would be in too much of a box. Uh, and then a friend of mine who was doing her PhD at NYU was telling me about the experience of doing it. And my husband said, well, you know, if you get into a top five PhD program, it's probably worth doing. And if you don't, it's not. So um, I was accepted to the Wharton School. Uh, I was the very last PhD student in what was called their Social System Sciences program, uh, which had been a thing that was started by a gentleman named Russ Acoff, who in his day was incredibly influential as a management thinker. He left Wharton in a big huff, and they were trying to determine that the school was going to continue to support this program, so they admitted me, among other other people. I spent four years at Wharton, and in between, um, so my husband, who was earning all the money for our collective enterprise, was still based in New York, and Wharton is in Philadelphia. So we plopped our, our <laughs> we plopped a pin down in between and moved to Princeton Junction, New Jersey. And he took the train one direction, and I took the train the other. Um, and when I finished my PhD, I had not been planning to look for a job. I, um, I had raised the money to do a postdoc year at Wharton, and the thought was, 
get my publications well underway, get wrap up some research that I was doing, and this would all be great. And um, I uh, got a call from a friend of mine, an actual phone call from a friend of mine who was at Columbia. And he said, look, you know, we've got a strategy job this year. Why don't you come along and give a job talk? And I thought, well, OK, you know, can't hurt to practice. And I'd finished my dissertation by then, which a lot of people don't do. And if you think of getting into academia, I'd encourage you be done before you go on the job market. And we can talk more about that if you want to. But anyway, so I'd finished my dissertation, went along, gave a job talk. I ended up being their number two candidate. Um, which was astonishing to me, but I had a lot of advocates on the Columbia faculty. Their number one candidate was a guy named Ranjay Gulati. He went off to Michigan. Um, and when he left for Michigan, I miraculously became the number one candidate. And so they offered me the job, and that's how I joined uh, Columbia. And then um, my husband and I were debating, well, he was in New York, I was in New York, should we move back to New York? And you know the thing about academic jobs is you just never know. Like you come up for a three-year review, and then you have a ten-year review, and a lot of there's a lot of movement around, at least in business school academia. And we thought, you know, let's not disrupt everything. By that time, we had two kids. Uh, let's just stay where we are, and we'll see kind of how you how things work out for you. Um, so that was in uh, that was in 1993, <laughs> and we've been there ever since. So I still live in Princeton Junction, um, and and come into the city obviously when I have to teach here. Um, there's nothing about my path that is replicable or predictable. But what I do think it illustrates is a couple of principles when you're thinking about these big career choices. I think the first one is optionality, right? Is this thing closing off future choices or is it opening up future choices? That's definitely one I would give some thought to. The second thing is, are you working at this intersection of what really interests you and intrigues you and you're learning it and it's really great and what you're actually good at? Like, I mean, I know a lot of people who, who take jobs that they're very fascinated by, but they're not actually that good at them. And so they're kind of hobbies. <laughs> So you want that intersection of the, the things you personally care about enough to really master it uh, and the things that uh, you, you, you tend to have a talent for. Uh, and then, you know, find, find a personal board of advisors, right? Find somebody to give you good advice along the way as you're considering different choices. The things I would uh, counsel you to avoid is making a snap choice because you think this is the last time an opportunity is ever going to present itself like that. Sometimes that's true, usually it's not. Um, or getting kind of railed into something because other people expect it of you or because you know that's sort of you were raised to do X, Y, Z and that's what your parents expect or whatever. Um, one last thing, my parents are both scientists, right? I mean, like, like a microbiologist and an organic chemist, and I'll never forget my dad looking at me going, so let me understand this. You're going into a field where simply developing a hypothesis counts as research? <laughs> he never really understood the social science angle of things. That's hilarious. Um, I, I guess I have to ask you about, for me, listening to your story and kind of hearing it, how does one keep oneself so open to career change? And that's kind of really, I know for us as college students, what do we think? We think linear path. We think, OK, we're going to go get the best IB job. We're going to go get the best private equity job. How, does, how do you stay open? And what do you think are kind of the best ways to embrace that uncertainty? That's a great, great question. Um, so the first sort of uber observation I would make is, you know, this isn't your dad's economy, right? Um, most of you will have relationships that are significant with 10, 15, 20 different kinds of organizations, uh, whether as an employee or whether as a contractor or whether as, you know, an advisor or something. So you're, you're going to be exposed to a lot more organizations. Um, and the way this gets talked about is the tour of duty career. And increasingly what we're seeing, and this is across the board, um, at least in America, not so much in Europe, not so much in Japan, but certainly in the United States, it's I sign up for a tour of duty that may be doing a specific project, it may be undertaking a specific task for a client, it may be a job rotation, and I see that through. And then my employer and me have to have a conversation about, okay, that's now wrapped up. Do I need to grow to move on from, to some other location? Do you have a role for me that would be a logical next step? Uh, the other thing that we're seeing, and I think this is actually very helpful when you want to be open to things, is um, people leave companies now, and it used to be, I mean, back in the day, you put your stuff in a cardboard box, security escorted you to the parking lot, and like, don't darken our doorstep again. That's totally not true today. I know of one company where one of their 
kind of most senior guys has actually been in and out 11 times. <laughs> and he'll come in for like 18 months, do what he does really, really well, and then they kind of run out of a role for him and he'll move somewhere else. So uh, a couple of other things to bear in mind is this notion that we have of a ladder where progress means you're moving up some kind of hierarchy. That is less and less the way big companies operate. Um, you see them delayering, you see them flattening. So if you take a company like Amazon, they have literally four layers between like the CEO, Andy Jassy, and, and ordinary people working, in, at least in the white collar part of Amazon. Um, so there's a lot less in the way of organizational layers, which means we often confuse career progress with hierarchical progress. And I, I'm going to encourage you not to think about it that way. So think about it perhaps instead the way that movies get made. Um, and if you think, if you go to a movie, right, and you sit through the titles at the beginning, there's like 200 companies that are listed because each of those companies brings something special to bear to the project. And your career progress is not measured by a hierarchy, right? <laughs> no movie maker is like a level four, you know, grade Q, you know, <laughs> kind, of, kind of person. Instead, they're measured by what they've accomplished, what value they've created, what projects they've been associated with, who's in their network, how well are they known. To take a personal case, like I have literally had the same job title since 1997 because <laughs> nobody looks at me that way. They look at me in terms of what value can I bring, you know, what companies would vouch for me, who, you know, who says good stuff about me on, you know, LinkedIn or whatever. So I think the, the courage to not get trapped into one of these tracks is to recognize there are so many more opportunities now and there's so much um, ease of being able to tap into them, uh, especially those of you that come from schools that have really good networks. Um, our daughter's partner is uh, a Princeton grad and I'm telling you, it's, it, it's like a cult. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, very strong ties, very supportive of each other. And, and I think you, you had a lot of assets to use. So don't, don't be afraid to not do like the traditional lockstep thing. I was actually literally about to ask you about that. And, uh -huh. and kind of a huge thing in business is going the next step, taking the MBA. And as a professor of an MBA, uh, I would say a relatively well accredited MBA program, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on the MBA for the future? The MBA for the future, oh boy, that's, that's a, a very question. fraught topic. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think the MBA at Columbia is going to be just fine. But if you say to people, well, you know, what are your top reasons to go get an MBA at a school like Columbia? I'll just pick on my own institution. We're all friends, right? And <laughs> Princeton doesn't have an MBA program, so not necessarily an issue for Princeton. Um, so, you know, what do they say? Number one thing is the network. Number two thing is, oh, you know, you're going to really get to know this group of people that are in your cluster. You know, you're going to really be able to build these things. You're going to have this this reputation, right? You got this brand behind you. You're accredited. You're like the admissions, I mean, our, our rate of admissions is like, 7%, 8%. So the fact that you made it through the admissions office, like that's a major stamp of, of you know, kind of you're able to do good stuff. So I used to joke with the dean, I said, you know, we could just save a lot of money by shutting the whole place down after the admissions office has done its job. And what could be, we'd be good. He, was, he wasn't amused. Anyway, so by the time you get to about item number 17, right, you're now down to, oh yeah, and you might learn something in the curriculum and whatnot. So I personally believe there's a lot of merit in the MBA curriculum, it's evolved a lot. Um, when I look at students with MBAs versus those without, they've just got a lot more tools in their toolkit. And they do have great networks, and they do have um, other things. You know, that much being said, um, what we are seeing kind of farther down the pecking order, so if you get to fill in blank, generic MBA from a sort of a mid-tier school, we're not seeing those same beneficial effects. So if you do decide to do an MBA, I'd suggest doing doing it either in person or in the executive MBA flavor, which is you take it as you're working. Those tend to skew a little bit older, but you get to keep your job. And the networking benefits and everything are just as good. But, you know, I, I would I would definitely make sure you don't, like, undercut yourself by doing, you know, a part-time or online or middle-tier kind of thing, because I don't know that the value is there for that. that. That's really good advice. Thank you so much. I. For me, personally, I, I'm more curious about what alternative routes one would take in trying to figure out their path to do an MBA, whether it's a startup, whether it's, and kind of your whole advice on what do you think is the best track towards, in, to finding that inspiration to take the MBA step? And I, mm -hmm. I wonder if it's like a startup, if it's working at, I don't know, say an IB firm, or any, any advice on that end? 
Sure. Well, we uh, at Columbia, we get all kinds of flavors. Um, so a very typical track is people start down engineering, consulting, sometimes startups, not, not typically, but sometimes. Um, and they get to a point where they feel they've reached the max that their current background can do for them, and they're really ready uh, to take the next step. And that's when typically we start thinking about an MBA. So I'll give you the examples of my own two kids. Uh, so our son went to uh, Trinity College in Ireland, in Dublin. Um, the fact that he could drink beer at 18 had no bearing whatsoever on his decision to, to go there, Not none whatsoever. But anyway, did his study in Ireland, came back to the US, um, landed a job with Accenture, the big consulting firm, and did what you do at Accenture when you're a brand new person, right? You just work nonstop on site with clients just grinding it out. And after kind of three, four years of that, he, he reached a point where he said, you know, I could keep doing this for the rest of my life. and. I'm not sure that's the trajectory I really want to be on. And we had a lot of discussions backwards and forwards. He applied to a number of different programs. He ended up going to Tuck. Uh, he was admitted to Columbia, which was very nice of them. Uh, but I was like, oh, no, no, no. He loves hockey. He likes winter sports. He loves skiing. And all the Tuckies, like, they travel in packs. <laughs> they're, they're very tightly connected. And I thought that would be just a great place for him to go. And it was. And he went there for a couple of years, uh, graduated from Tuck, and then joined uh, InnoSight, which is an innovation consulting firm, uh, and has been very happy there. Uh, through the pandemic, they've supported him re working remotely. He's now um, an associate partner, so he's now among the leadership team in that firm. Um, and so that's like one path. Uh, but I think, I think it's this sense of, you know, I've reached the limit of what I can do with what I've got, and I, I need something significant to shift, to really change the trajectory that I'm on. So our daughter, completely different setting. She she um, went to Barnard as well, so I spent her entire college search doing this. Because, you know, <laughs> it's mom's college. Like, if mom says it's a good idea, it's automatically ruled out. So anyway, she went to Barnard, loved it as it happened. It was great. Then she did a White House internship uh, in the Obama administration. Then she took a job with the a Manhattan District Attorney's Office uh, investigating white collar crime. So she's kind of got this do-gooder thing going on. And it was similar. She felt that, you know, again, public service, career goes like this in the first few years, and then you hit this plateau. And for her, it was really, she also felt she was, um, her major was um, modern European history. We couldn't even do all of European history. No, we had to be modern European history with a minor in French. Like, what do you do with that, right? Um, so she'd been classically liberal arts trained. She's a very good writer. And that, I think, is one of the things that really differentiates her. She writes beautifully. Um, and she went back to get an MBA for a couple of reasons. One was uh, she really felt she needed that kind of math, finance, how business works background. She really wanted the content. Um, and similar, she felt she was kind of at that moment where she'd stopped really learning and, and growing in her current role and couldn't really see a clear path to that happening. And the logical thing, if you're working in the DA's office, is you go back to law school, and she didn't want to do that. She felt that um, she's not a confrontation person. Like, like she's, very, she's very poised. She's got a great spine, but she didn't want to spend all day every day arguing, you know, <laughs> and so, so the MBA turned out to be better for her. She then joined a firm, which she's been very happy at, which was run by two Columbia Business School uh, alums who, um, they, they, ra they help um, not-for-profits with their fundraising. And so a typical not-for-profit can't afford like a Columbia MBA to come work for you to lay out your fundraising campaign. So that's the niche that they occupy, and she's been very happy there. Awesome. I want to take a little pivot and start talking about your startup, Baylies, and <laughs> and I kind of wanted to, to get into that and have you sure. elaborate because sure. I think a lot of people out there and a lot of people in this crowd know a lot about startups and really want to hear awesome. that information from you. Oh, sure. So, um, so as you know, you know, I teach and I write and I write books and stuff. And what what became very frustrating for me is I would do all that and then come, people would come to my classes and they'd be like, this is amazing, like the scales have fallen from my eyes, this is wonderful. And then they'd go back to their organizations and they'd be just paralyzed. It's like, well, what what is it? Is it a spreadsheet? Is it a PowerPoint? Is it like, how do I make this happen? Um, and so it's actually pronounced Valise and Valise was okay, uh, not, not a problem. Um, it, it could go either way. Um, and I did not have a fancy brand consultant come up with this. And no, 
I, we can talk about where the name came from. Um, but Valise is really all about that bridging that gap between here's the theory and the ideas, and here's how you put them to work uh, in your organizations. So we do some advisory, so some, you can think of it as consulting, but it's not really consulting in the sense of we come in and do it for you. It's like we come in and show you how to do it, and then we expect you to be able to learn to do it yourself. Then there's a software spine, which is basically taking discovery-driven planning and making it instrumented so that you can actually use this software as you're, as you're doing your planning. And then a whole series of diagnostics and little online learning sessions which supplement the, the first two. So, um, you know, and like any startup, it's had its highlights and it's had its lowlights. I'm on my third software developer because I just couldn't find one that would deliver what I really wanted. Um, and the team's turned over a couple of times. But now I think we're, we're, we're getting ready for a really good um, 23, I think. I mean, 2022 was kind of a building year and now we're really moving forward pretty pretty yeah, well. I, wanted, I actually, you, you brought up a very important point and I kind of wanted to hit on it. So with Valise, uh, with Valise? Valise, okay, awesome. Um, with Valise, what kind of difficulties did you go through when working with your business and building your business? You talked about your software developer and I kind of wanted to hear if there's anything else. Oh, yeah, well, you know, any startup, you've got so many unknowns. Um, beginning with who, who are you working with? Like, who's on your team? And, um, I made assumptions about the capabilities of people on the team, which turned out to be not very well founded. Like there were, there were people that I paid a lot of money to who I thought would be able to advance me to a certain level, and that didn't happen. Um, so I think you have to really think about the team. You have to really think about managing your cost up front, uh, because in the early stages, you really don't even know what it is yet. Like I knew I wanted it to be a tools company, and I knew I wanted it to be helpful uh, to people trying to implement these ideas. I did not have a whole lot more clarity than that. And so there was a fair amount of experimentation. Um, the first tech company, they said, oh, we love this idea. We'll come in with our tech and, and, and do that part of it. Um, and they actually never proved able to really make the dream a reality. The second tech company, uh, that basically fell apart because they had internal problems. They had a private equity investor come in and there was a lot of, just a lot of messing around. And eventually that fell apart, not because of anything I did, but because as a partner, they, they were, the people I was doing business with left the company and the people that were left weren't committed to the project. It was just on and on and on. Um, and now I'm very happy with the third party developer. But I, you know, and on the one hand, it would be great not to have to go through all that heartache. On the other hand, like by the time I got to this third developer, like I knew exactly what I was looking for, and I was perfectly prepared to walk away if they couldn't deliver on that. So, you know, I, I will never know whether I had to go through the first two painful learning experiences to finally make some traction with the third one. So, so I think team, uh, who your tech partners are, and then real clarity about the kind of problem that you're solving, which I frame in terms of what's the job to be done. Um, following Clay Christensen and Tony Ulwick, like who's your target client? What is the issue that they're wrestling with? And why is your solution better than anybody else's? Any other way they could get that met? I think those are some lessons I would learn. Um, it helps if you're not under financial pressure. And, and I don't mean like you have to have lots and lots and lots of VC money, but when you're still in that early wandering around phase, right, if you don't commit yourself to fixed costs, if you don't commit yourself to you know, a regular monthly outlay, like paying people salaries and stuff like that, it just gives you so much more opportunity to learn than if you, I mean, I see so many startups go wrong because you know, they take on this financial burden or they take investors and then the investors don't, you know, the investors are like, we're gonna tell you what we want you to do and they completely distort the, the learning process. So I'd be really patient in the early stages and try to learn as much as you can at lowest possible cost. And then as your learning improves, um, you, you can begin to see the business pay its own way. So Valise um, has paid its own way for the last two years. So it's no longer, I no longer have to put money into it. It's not, it, you know, it's earning its keep now. I mean, that's awesome. Like, I'm not, I'm not like Warren Buffett level of income, but at least I'm not losing money anymore. No, that's awesome. I, uh, I kind of wanted to open the floor a little bit in case Great. anyone had questions before I start asking more questions because I have a lot of questions that sure. I would like to ask sure, you, but sure, sure. I would like to open the floor and see if anybody wants to ask you any questions. Absolutely. Hi, so first of all, thanks a lot for the talk. I think it was really interesting. My name is Sam. I'm a final year uh, philosophy, politics, and economics student at the University of York. Um, and my question is about the example you gave in the beginning. I've just been like thinking about that the whole time uh, with Disney um, and like Euro Disney. Um, like, 
working in France sometimes seems like a problem for Disney. Like I was listening to a podcast the other day, and they have like a more recent problem with I think it's the films. The way the French like system set up is you have to pay like a certain amount of tax basically to keep like French cinema going, and um, Disney like are like, confused about that. Um, so I wanted to know like in your work, how often do you see like these almost like cultural differences? Like being big reasons why these, you know, new ventures fail. Uh, well, international ones, yeah, that's huge. It often takes you by surprise. So let's take Disney as a point in time. So Walt Disney, the man, had this idea of coming up with a theme park, which he put out in California. And everybody during his lifetime said, Walt, you're out of your minds. Nobody's going to want to pay good money to, like, ride around on fake rivers and watch animatronic animals. And, and you're out of your mind. So built the theme park. Big success, right? Becomes the standard for that kind of entertainment across the world. Then the last project Walt Disney, the man, supervised personally was in the mid-'80s. And and they took the Disney concept to Florida. And again, everybody said, you're crazy, you people, right? There's nothing in Orlando but alligators and sand. There's not even an international airport at the time. Um, and so big, big success. Now, now, you would think by now they thought they knew what they were doing. So they next went to Japan. And again, people were like, oh, my God, the, the thing is right near Tokyo. You can see it yeah. if you take the bus in from the airport. Um, and and it's, it's very accessible. And, and, but, it, but it turned into a big success. So then when we came to Europe, right, so now we think we know what we're doing. And we put up this theme park in France. And we make a whole bunch of assumptions. Now, it turns out that even though Japanese and American people are very different culturally, their eating and amusement behaviors are very similar. Both Americans and Japanese are very happy snacking and munching and eating all day long. And so the park that you build for people that behave that way is a very different park than the one you would build for people who want to come in at noon, sit down, have a two-hour lunch with wine, <laughs> and you know you just you have the wrong physical plant. So the other thing that happened was they had a bit of a funding glitch, and so they opened up with only half the rides that that they were expecting, which meant the night stays didn't last. So their all their assumptions in terms of how much they would make on meals. Oh, it turns out also French people don't buy as many Mickey Mouse hats and you know concessions and stuff as Americans do, um, and so all their assumptions were just off by you know by a bit. Now my point here is you. Some of that, you know, maybe you couldn't have anticipated, but a lot of it you could. I mean, you could see how European people eat, right? I mean, that would not be a difficult thing to spot. Um, and so, you know, very smart company, but that that's what undid them in that particular venture. Now, they've corrected it now. They've turned it into a business destination. It's now Europe's most frequently visited tourist stop. So they've, they've corrected the problems, but boy, it was painful getting there. Thank you. Any more questions for Rita? Um, my name is Samiksha. I'm a freshman at Princeton. And one thing that came into my mind as you were speaking is one of my favorite quotes, that you should work five to nine until you can quit your nine to five. And I think that really embodies this new acceleration towards the ideal that um, entrepreneurship is better than traditional employment and corporate employment. And so I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on that, that dichotomy and how we as students should navigate that as we accelerate into the professional world. Yeah, I mean, a couple, couple of things. Um, the first one is I think options are great. And to the extent that you have a passion project that you're working on or something that's helping you learn and grow beside what you're doing for your day job, um, I, I think that's great. I really do. Because that's often where the unexpected opportunity will turn up that you didn't really plan for, but you're prepared for, right? And so it's that preparation that I think is terrific. Um, I do think we're looking at a world where, you know, we're all entrepreneurs now, right? We're all, we're all having to take charge of our own careers and nobody's going to do it for you. And so having that entrepreneurial experience I think is great. As an employer myself, I have uh, two full-time people that work with me. Um, I look for that, right? It, I mean, it, old school it used to be. People would look at entrepreneurs and they'd go, wait a minute, you're going to be moonlighting on my dollar. And today I think that's really flipped. We're saying we want people who have their passion and the courage of their convictions and can come up with ideas that are maybe be, uh, beside what we're um, hearing. So I think it's great. I think that's a, a good piece of advice. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it without thinking through, like, w what am I learning, and is that worth the time? And you know, I don't want to, I don't want to burn out, right? Now that also gets back to your choice of first job, 
Because if you're going to go work for Goldman or you're going to go work for one of those firms, and they own you. <laughs> like, like, I'm serious. Like, there was a big controversy about whether they could require 100 hours a week or, or more. Um, and so, you know, you won't have the chance to do as much of that extracurricular learning. Now, they'll pay you a ton. Um, but a lot of that work is not all that interesting, to be perfectly honest. It's doing the, the mechanics behind the deals and the trades. And you're not, you're not going to be growing and developing as much as you can. A couple of other things to look for uh, in, in your formal employment is ask about how much support they give to your development. Like, is there, a, is there a training budget that you're allowed to spend? You know, do you get five grand a year to invest in coursework or to invest in building new skills? Um, I think that's a really valuable question to ask. As an employer, I, I do that. I believe in it. Um, so that's another one. Uh, last thing I'll say, just because some of us are, are female here, um, I do think um, Women tend to undersell themselves when they're thinking of, of taking on something that's new. Um, you know, the, the old joke like at my school is if a guy's got two items on a 10 item list, they're like, hey, I got this, right? <laughs> and a woman's got like eight of them and she's like, oh, I just don't know, you know? I had a woman in class once um, and she was trying to make a move from an industrial role to an education role and her experience was perfect for this role in education, except she was very nervous about would it be, would the, would the, would the recruiter see it as a transfer skill. And she literally began her cover letter with the phrase, while I do not have direct experience in education, I mean, don't do that. <laughs> you know, you really want to make sure that you're communicating the value that you bring to whoever is consequential in making those kinds of decisions. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. I actually want to expand on that a little sure. bit and ask about disparities in the classroom and how gender kind of plays a role in that. And, and I know as a man, like, I don't really have that experience, but I, I want to hear your perspective as an MBA, as a female MBA professor, on how the MBA program is either changing or staying the same. Or it's come a long way. It's come a really long way. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I took a bunch of joint classes in the MBA program, and you know, you had this type, right? They, they were they wanted to get their MBA. They wanted to get right on the number one train and get out at Wall Street and make their packages of money. And they had a very you know narrow view of of the world, and their you know respect for and consideration of their female colleagues was not always at a par that uh, I thought was appropriate. Uh, it has changed a lot. Um, uh, the We've been much more conscious about making sure women um, are, are able to fully participate. We've been much more conscious about increasing the numbers, right? Um, because that helps too. You know, the more of you there are, the less the less um, the less alone you feel. The less you feel like you're the one that's sort of sticking out. Um, yeah. So I think it's changed a lot. Uh, Columbia itself has rethought what it's doing from a, a, I think at one point, maybe when I first started working there, we were really seen as a school to breed finance people. I mean, that was that was kind of one of our things. And since then, we've really tried to diversify the curriculum. We've added a lot on entrepreneurship. We've added a lot on social ventures. Uh, you'll meet people there who really see Columbia as a way of you know making a big contribution in the world. We've really ratcheted down the number of people that go to um, finance. In fact, there was one year where the number one employer for Columbia MBAs was Amazon. Wow. Amazon, because they wanted to get the, t the, nobody thought they were going to make a career at Amazon, but they thought a couple of years really learning how this remarkable company works would be would be helpful, and then I think that has proved out. Um, you know, it's still an issue, and I mean, there's a pile of research which shows that there, there are still um, issues with women feeling comfortable speaking up, getting interrupted, getting mansplained to, blah, 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 blah. Um, so a couple of interventions we have been making is uh, we institute a no interruption rule. So if you're in a decision-making situation, you everybody gets two minutes, and nobody else talks while that person is talking. That can help. Uh, there's a thing called the nominal group technique, which is you know the facilitator poses a question, what's the best way to? And without everybody sort of leaping in and having conversations, everybody documents what they're thinking. And then that those sets of ideas get captured, and then you have a, a fairly well-moderated discussion process. So these things can be overcome, but I think you do have to make an effort to do that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, and I, I really am happy to hear that things are moving past where they were, because where they were was just unacceptable. Uh, I, I also By the way, you, you want a thankless job? Try being a 31-year-old assistant professor teaching strategy in a room with about 80% 28-year-old white men. <laughs> That's not a fun experience. <laughs> I could only imagine. I could only imagine. So again, I would like to open the floor to sure. Q&A.
Uh, hi, thank you for talking about, um, very interesting, you have like startup going on and your professor life. So I'm curious, like in order to maintain successful career as a woman, how do you balance that with your family life and um, other core values in your personal life? And um, just like planning family into your career as well. Yeah, it's a great question. It's like the elephant in the room, right, um, that, that we all talk about. And so let me start off with an observation. Um, most large corporations are not designed with women's life cycles in mind. They are built around a male life cycle. So here's what happens. In your 20s, you kind of figure out what you want to be in the world. Your 30s, you sort of sort it into high potential and everybody else. Your 40s, you begin to take the reins of power. You're having kind of a manifestation. Your 50s, you're allowed one Corvette and a blonde. And then your 60s, you're like, handing over to the next generation. So the first observation I would make is that kind of doesn't work for women, right? Biology is just how it goes. Um, and so you have a couple of choices. Uh, the first choice is to recognize that if you are a mom, um, if you are taking on a family, if you're taking on elder care, if you're taking on community responsibilities, that that is going to take energy and time and, and so forth. So I think you just need to acknowledge that. This sort of myth that you can squeeze 10 pounds of stuff into a five pound bag, it just doesn't happen. So what that implies is you have to be very deliberate about the choices that you make um, and the trade-offs that you make. So my husband and I very much, uh, he had a super corporate job. He was an actuary for one of the leading firms in New York for many years. And like, like high, tension, high demand. I mean, there'd be nights he'd be getting home at 2 in the morning because the deadline for the committee meeting of the United Nations he had to prepare for was, was then. And so our negotiation was my job was more flexible. It wasn't less demanding. It was just less corporate, you know, and, and, uh, and so we very deliberately talked about that, like who is going to take responsibility for this. A um, couple of other observations. Don't be afraid to get help. And don't make yourself nuts. Like kids, honestly, when I was growing up, we gave them frozen fish fingers and they all survived. They do not need, you know, organic, hand milled kumbacha. I mean, no, you know, we make it too hard for ourselves. <laughs> we really do. Um, and so don't be afraid to, like, I mean, it was Margaret Mead's daughter, actually, who pointed this out. She said her mom was perfectly, Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, was perfectly happy grilling a steak and throwing some asparagus in the steamer and calling it done. And she would go through these elaborate, you know, Middle Eastern banquets and stuff. So, so take some of that off your plate if it's not necessary. So you really need to think about what's important that you do. Also think about what's important that you do versus what somebody else could do. I mean, I think those are trade-offs that you make. Um, I guess the last thing I would offer, and this is going to be hard for you because you know, you're know you just getting started, right? Um, but lives today are long and careers today are long. And I would say, you know, I always had a really great career. I felt very supported by my husband. We did a lot of stuff. But I'll tell you, once the kids were out of the house, it was like I'm off to the races. And now is probably the most um, productive time I've had to focus on what I want to build and what I want to do. Um, you know, and I wouldn't have taken that, all that on if I still had kids at home, if I still had those responsibilities. Um, last thing I'll finish on, and, and you will recently have been this to your parents, um, which is babies are not so hard. Like babies, you get to make all the decisions, what they wear, where they go, who's looking after them, what they eat. Like you're in charge. Teenagers, abandon all hope. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and, and I think that takes a lot of people by surprise. They think, OK, once I've got like babyhood behind me and the kids are in school, I'm done. Uh-uh. You, know, you really have to be a lot more present. And in fact, it's Anne-Marie Slaughter from Princeton who wrote this incredibly controversial article about why women couldn't still have it all. And she gave up this incredibly demanding foreign policy job in the Obama administration to come back to Princeton so she could be a presence in her kids' lives. Now, they're now moved on. She's now at the New America Foundation working like an absolute demon, doing great things. But that particular fragile period, she felt she needed to be there. So it's a lot of choices. And there's no one right path. Um, in some fields, taking yourself out like at whatever level to have kids, you know, in your late twenties, early thirties, is hard. It's hard. Um, that much being said, I do think I do think you know more and more women are in senior leadership positions. More and more of them have been through this. More and more of them are willing to say, "Let's figure out a way this can work for you." And kind of back to my argument about entrepreneurial careers. Um, if that's what's expected of you, you can actually create a lot more flexibility than you might think you have. And I think employers, after the great recession and the great resignation and all this change that we've been through, they're coming to grips with it too. I think it's easier, it's certainly easier than, than when I started. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh. 
No, you guys can line up too if you if you want to go over and take that mic as well. You can. Sorry. Sorry. Hi. That's okay. Hi. Uh, so my name is Harsha. I am from the University of Pennsylvania. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, and I was here yesterday for the Impact Challenge where I was presenting about my startup. Um, and one of the things that I really, really loved that you said was about your startup and how it kind of bridges the gap between the research and the application. Um, in my work previously, I have worked with organizations. I've been at that times brought in for some consultancy and all of that to bring in new ideas and things to these large companies. And often I do see that implementation can be hard for such large organizations to make even the smallest of changes. And that is often, and even if there are great people in the organization who want to make a change, there could be so many systems in place stopping them from being able to execute that. Could you share more about how you've been navigating that and how you've actually been able to create meaningful change from the perspective of someone outside of an organization coming in and trying to stir things up a little bit? Absolutely, um, that's a lot of what I do. Um, so first thing I would say is uh, you don't wanna boil the ocean, right? You don't wanna sort of do a huge big, like we're gonna change everything all at once because the organization won't be able to digest it. So the what I will often do is I'll start working at a project level or at a level where you can get everybody that's responsible for making decisions like in a room and have a conversation about what you're gonna do. And then use that success, assuming it's successful, as the seed bed for the other changes that you might wanna make. So I'd say start with something relatively contained and, and then use that to bridge out to other parts because everybody loves success. If you do something that works, uh, people will be much more inclined to get on board and, and follow it. Uh, and so you want to pick something where you have a pretty high uh, expectation that you know what to do and that it's going to work. So that, that's the first thing I would start with. Secondly, I think you want to have um, a real sense of how, where you want to get to. So this whole notion of what does success look like and then work backward. But you get there in small steps, typically. You get there like one division at a time, one project at a time, one group at a time. And then eventually you start to get to some root causes of why things perhaps went off the rails. And then you can start to tackle some of those more systemic things. Uh, it is very helpful to have a political coalition in support. So find those allies, find the other people in the system who feel they'd like to see things change. Um, don't be afraid to be a bridge. As an outsider, you can talk to finance and marketing and you know operations and accounting uh, because you're seen as, as being, you know, you're not trapped in a silo. So you have that going for you as well. And you can find those um, uh, common uh, you know, you, you know, fellow travelers that want to see the same outcome you want. So that's where I would start. Um, having C-level support is very valuable. It's hard to make a big change happen without that. I mean, if you've got a five-year program and your CEO is on a three-year to retirement time frame, abandon all hope. Just don't even start. <laughs> because that person is not going to want to be in the middle of a transformation when they have to exit stage left. Um, so you need to be kind of careful about the political dynamics. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Karen Yap, and I go to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, I have two minors um, in public policy with the Brookings Institution and then in global entrepreneurship. And so I found myself throughout my career trying to balance my interest in public policy, but also my interests in business and entrepreneurship. So I was wondering how your experiences in public policy, if at all, have shaped your current career. Oh, they absolutely were transformational. They, they really were. So I was 20 three when I started working for the city of New York and I was put into a role of um, actually managing a project which was the automation, now brace yourselves, this is very sexy, the automation of the procurement function of the city of New York, um, which at the time was all paper based and very, well they had like a mini computer in there, they had a Wang system in there I think. but. As a function of that role, I was able to, eventually, I had a group of 12 people that reported to me. I had a whole team of about 50 consultants that I was managing. And you got to see how the organization responded to large scale change, where you could make an impact, where you could, you know, if you press that lever, this is what happened. And I had the incredible support of my boss, the guy I reported to, and he basically was like, you got this, you don't run with it. Like, I, you don't need me. <laughs> so the experience is phenomenal. So that was a great, beginning. And remember, I'd, I was kind of doing the entrepreneurship thing sort of in there, too. So I had the both. the both. So I think the public policy stuff really teaches you about um, 
social outcomes. It really teaches you about management. It really teaches you about what what keeps organizations going without the pressure of, you know, we've had a bad quarter, we've got to report to the street, we've got to, all, all that sort of financial pressure. It lets you really learn. So I saw it as a great learning lab. And a lot of those experiences have fed directly into my current work with companies. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. My name, is, my name is Matt, I'm a fellow speaker, uh, so thank you for your time. Um, I was wondering, um, do you have, with your, the, your, the firm that you work with, do you have an advisory board, and what do you think, what's your advice on, um, use, on using a network, an advisory board, uh, mentors to expand your circle of confidence? Oh, I think it's great. I think it really makes a difference. So I would point you to the work of a guy named Keith Ferrazzi, F-E-R-R-A-Z-Z-I. Um, and he's written a whole series of books. One of the most famous ones was called Never Eat Alone. Um, but he offers some great tips and tools on how do you build a network? What's your personal board of advisors like? How do you create these deep relationships where people are not afraid to give you candid feedback? Um, you know, as you, as you develop, one of the hardest things it's going to get, and it gets harder and harder the more senior you are, is to have people give you an honest perspective on what's going on with you, with your life, with what you're thinking. Um, so building that personal personal board of directors is is huge. But you want to be very picky about it, right? I mean, these are people who you, you want to have a mutual relationship with, so you're going to be doing for them what they're doing for you. Um, you also want to make sure that you've got people with the right kinds of unrelated to you but relevant experience. So when I think about the people that were very instrumental in my past, um, a few were women, a, a lot weren't, but a few were. But they all had like different um, points of competency that they came from for me. So I had one advisor who was just brilliant at how to navigate the academic system, right, which is a whole another conversation. Um, I had another advisor who was great at just breaking down barriers. I mean, he would say things like, I'm not coming to your conference unless McGrath comes to, you know, so I mean, that's real sponsorship, right? Um, and so forth. So, so the people that had access to different resources and different perspectives, but who, you know, who had your best interest at heart, I think that's really valuable. Thank you. Sure. sure. Are there any more questions? Oh, wait, are there any more questions for Professor McGrath, before I, I wrap this up and give a, a couple final questions. Great, sure. Okay, all right. First and foremost, what attracted you to teaching? Why share your information? Oh, what attracts me to teaching? Well, I love learning, and and I'm very curious. My children would say nosy, um, <laughs> and that's just been lifelong, and so I've always been intrigued by teaching. You know, in many ways, teaching is a lot like acting. And uh, and in high school, I was I was part of all the plays. I did the props, and then eventually, I did some acting stuff. Um, and I think it's that notion of connect connecting with an audience, connecting with um, what you know, what building that rapport between an audience, and whether that's a play, whether that's a piece of art, whether that's a management theory, uh, that's always been really exciting to me, like as long as I can remember. So uh, the teaching part was great. The more tricky part is the research part because mm. teaching, I mean, we all know what teaching is, right? You're in a classroom, you're yucking it up, you're having a great time, you're telling jokes, it's amazing. The research stuff, you are in a room by yourself, staring into space, trying to figure out what the latest you know, regression analysis is teaching you about the relationship between power, autonomy, and results. I mean, that's, that's hard. <laughs> and for somebody who likes to be in the classroom, that's really hard. So that was actually the harder part of the job than the teaching part. I could only imagine. I know I struggle with it a lot. <laughs> Um, my, oh, there's one more, oh, first. Did you want to ask us? Mixon, sure. definitely get in here. Yeah, um, I, j I just had a quick question. Um, seeing your background in strategy, what would be your top maybe three or five recommendations on how to come up with a good strategic plan for like five years, three years? Oh, wow, a good strategic, so the question was, how do you come up with a good strategic plan for five years going forward? Well, I think the first thing you need to do is figure out what's going on. Um, and I like to look at that in terms of five Cs. So what's going on with my customers? What's going on with my competition? What's going on with my complementary relationships? Who else is in my ecosystem? What about my organization and its capabilities? And lastly, the bigger context. So there's usually a period of fairly deep immersion into what are the patterns going on around me. And once you've got some clarity 
thinking about that, then it's okay, what are our options? What, are, what is the range of choices that we are needing to make? And then you kind of have to pick a direction. Now, you, you, the direction may cause you to shift, but, but you pick a direction. Uh, then you're into now much more execution. So now you have to align the organization and then you know, execute against today while you're investing for tomorrow. And it, it sort of operates holistically. So it's not really a... a a single point in time, it's really more of a process. A great example of a company that I think does this well is Salesforce. And they have a thing they call the V2 Mom Strategy Statement, which stands for, I don't like the acronym, but that's what they call it. Um, vision, values, uh, methods, obstacles, and metrics. And every person at Salesforce puts these all down on one page at regular intervals throughout the year, starting with Mark Benioff, their CEO. Uh, and then every single person has theirs up on the Salesforce chatter system. So if I'm meeting with you and I'm at Salesforce, I can actually look up what's in your V2 mom. It creates tremendous alignment. And so once you've got the clarity of strategy, then it's how do you line up the organization behind you. And something like a V2 mom is incredibly helpful. Wow, I didn't know any of that information. That's awesome. There you I, go. That's crazy. Stick with me, kid. We can learn a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, thank you, Professor, so much for coming here today and speaking with us. I, I've learned so much in this hour, and I think all of our attendees have as well, and I, can, I can truly can't thank you enough. Oh, great. So a couple of um, places to go for deeper dives. So my website is incredibly creatively called readamagraph.com. <laughs> I'm easy to find. I publish a weekly Thought Sparks newsletter on stuff I think is interesting. So last week's was on Ford and their deciding to shut down their autonomous car business after putting like $3 billion into it. Um, so that comes out every week. You can subscribe. Um, if you have further questions and want to follow up, I'm easy to find. Just go to my website. My email is right there and uh, reach out. I'd love to uh, keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you.